started a bit late. I wonder whether we could have the questions at the end of the two papers. Yeah. That work for you. Thank you yep. very much. Um, Well, first of all, thank you, Professor Cheney, who was at the South, uh, Southampton Seoul End University, which I failed to mention, so I remember to mention where Rosemary comes from. Um, thank you very much for that topic. Um, the kind of early history of, of, of the grand uh, of the grand tour, um, and particularly the kind of Catholic origins as well. Um, Rosemary Sweet is at the University of um, my notes, uh, University of Leicester. She is professor and of urban history and the director of the Centre for Urban History. Um, and she's also the co-editor of the Urban History Journal. Um, she has published on a uh, lot of contemporary urban culture, a particular book that I know, um, Antiquary, the Discovery of the Past in 19th Century Britain, and that was published in 2004. She's now working on a, on a project which obviously falls, that comes out of that early book which is a project on British travellers in Italy in the long 18th century. Thank you, Jim. And when I gave the paper, I put specific dates on which was very unwisely, because I realised I'm talking much more about the 18th century than um, I thought I might at the start, but never mind. Anyway, um, as an 18th century historian, one of the things that always bothers me is when does the 18th century end? And 18th century historians are notorious for colonising bits of other centuries, um, particularly the 17th and the 19th. And I thought, thinking about the Grand Tour, one of the interesting things is when does the experience of travel to Italy, which we can characterise by the term the Grand Tour, become something actually positively different in terms of the Victorian experience, which quite clearly is, uh, has a very different itinerary, very different expectations, very different purposes. And so one of the things that interests me is how do we lurch from the 18th century into the 19th century. It's something which has bothered me in terms of looking at urban culture, urban government, urban politics. And it's something which bothers me when trying to think about the, the grand tour. And I think there are a number of ways in which we can sort of distinguish 19th century travel from the 18th century. is the breakdown of the traditional itinerary. There's the increasingly middle class character of the tourists. There's the diminu diminution of a time which is actually spent in Italy. It's no longer a process of years or months. It becomes a matter of weeks. And it's a, the discovery of the Italian South. But what I want to focus on today, given the um, focus of the seminars, is the particular changes in the way that Rome was perceived by British visitors during this and again, there are a number of different angles, I think, from which we can approach this. And I want to just sketch out briefly um, three different angles. The first is a much greater interest in the historical development of Rome, which is informed by the archaeological evidence, the antiquities, which are increasingly no longer valued simply because of the historical associations, but because of their value as evidence from which a new form of knowledge can be constructed. The second way, I think, is a much more discriminating approach to the architectural remains, which draw much stronger distinctions between Etruscan, Republican, Imperial and late Imperial monuments, which ties into this interest in the historical development. Again, it's rather than simply looking at the individual monument, they're being seen as part of an ongoing process of the development of the city. And again, tied to that is the growing awareness of the early Christian and the late antique city and further its development during the medieval period. And here I think just beginning to get back to the idea of pilgrimage in that this is when the um, travellers start taking much more notice in the early Christian history of Rome. And so the whole idea of pilgrimage does begin to come back in. It's becoming desecularized, if you like, by the... Um, end of the period I'm looking at. So those are really the three main areas <coughs> I'm trying to look at in this paper today. So for 50 years ago, Arnaldo Momigliano defined the antiquary as someone who seeks to attribute objects to identified persons or periods. And this definition works admirably in terms of describing the way in which the majority of visitors to Rome in the 18th century approach the city's antiquities. It was a matter, as so many commentators observed, of matching the antiquity to the text or heroic personage with whom they were familiar from their school days. And the subsequent history of Rome, whilst not devoid of interest, was always subordinated to these aims. 
And this is embodied in the way in which Rome was described. Classical monuments were generally divorced from their context in the modern city. Modern Rome was described only insofar as it reflected or attempted to recreate the ideals of antiquity. So this was a perspective in which the chronological passage of time was compressed and in which antiquities were deracinated from their temporal context. And although antiquaries and visitors were very well informed of the dates of Roman history and would meticulously match each monument to a specific emperor or event, which in turn would give it a place in a historical narrative, their approach to buildings or antiquities was essentially static. Just as the images, like this one here from Degutet, the, um, the picture of the pamphlet here, represents an idealized image of the antiquity as it must have looked in its original perfection. And just as these images eliminated all indications of a passage of time and failed to record damage and deterioration, the characteristic response of the 18th century tourist to antiquities was to describe them in terms of a single point of time, typically their original foundation or construction. So again, as Momigliano pointed out, their significance lay with a personage or event with which they were associated or in terms of illustrating a particular architectural or sculptural perfection. Antiquarian debate, therefore, focused around identifying a building or reconstructing its original extent, rather than thinking about its subsequent use or its place in the evolving history of Rome. But by the end of the 18th century, this pro approach is beginning to change. The same interest in stylistic development, which was articulated in Wilhelm's study of statuary, made itself felt in approaches to the built environment. There was much more engagement with distinguishing between the monuments of Republican, Imperial and late Imperial Rome and evaluating otherwise unidentified elements in terms of when they were likely to have been built rather than simply trying to affix an identity upon them. So Joseph Forsyth, writing in 1812, although he's actually travelling rather earlier, was explicit about the need to approach the city in a historical sense tracing first its outline under the Republic, then, as it was under Nero, before the Great Conflagration, and then the later Imperial City. And he was rigorous in identifying the historical progression and decline of art and architecture through monuments and antiquities. The impact of Greek classicism was also to award a new value to the simplicity of Republican, structure, Republican structures, which were closer to the Greek originals, and to sharpen the critique of the excesses and corruptions of later imperial Rome. And the quality of the architecture was also determined by considerations of moral and political virtue. So that now, even monuments which had traditionally been beyond criticism were being subjected to sharper critical scrutiny as the British became more confident in their own imperial role in comparison with that of Rome. In the early 19th century, the remains of the Republic consistently attracted more positive notice, whilst admiration for later structures was tempered by criticism of imperial hubris and the effeminacy of society swamped by luxury, a critique which is best epitomised in the descriptions of the imperial baths of the Colosseum. So the Cloaca Maxima, from being a rather nondescript site mentioned only by virtue of the fact that it was one of the few remains which could definitely be associated with the Republic, which was a reliable account from Pliny, it started to elicit effusive peons of praise from visitors who had discovered that cleanliness was next to godliness. The Cloaca Maxima fused one in 1821 is one of the most wonderful works which any people ever constructed. The exponential growth of cities in early 19th century Britain undoubtedly created a generation of travellers who were not only convinced of the superiority of republican over imperial virtue, but were also aware of the crucial importance of such feats of civil engineering for urban society. Thus another tourist, Thomas Henry White, writing in 1841, was equally eloquent, describing it as perhaps the most extraordinary structure in Rome. The sharper distinction being drawn between the monuments of Republican and Imperial Rome was not in itself new, but it simply represents a more rigorous application of a mode of analysis which had been present in a more muted manner throughout the 18th century. There were other differences becoming apparent too, such as the greater weight being attract, attached to the evidence of archaeological excavations, a tendency which unsurprisingly became much more noticeable in the era following the French excavations in the Forum and around. <coughs> 
Prior to this, excavations were of interest only to the extent that they were productive of more antiquities for collectors in the sale room. But the French excavations, as has been well documented by Ronald Ridley or Frank Salmon, transformed the understanding of ancient Rome's topography and led to the re-identification of a number of antiquities, such as the Temple of Castor and Pollux. They also demonstrated what had only gradually been discerned before, especially by English visitors, how much could be learned from the physical remains, irrespective of what had survived in textual sources. Sir John Chetwood Eustace, visiting in 1812, urged more excavations not as a mean to un means of uncovering additional items, but as a means of furthering understanding. Six years later, John Camp Hobhouse, in 1818, was acutely aware of how much more had been discovered about the history of Rome through antiquarian research and recent excavations. Whatever the earth covered of these magnificent structures is now exposed to view, he wrote, and the remains are sufficient to show what must be the subterranean riches of Rome. He was frustrated, however, by the lack of any intelligent synthesis that could provide a connected history of the city. Such a synthesis was eventually provided in 1831 by Richard Burgess, who wrote The Topography Antiqu and Antiquities of Rome. Burgess not only studied the excavations himself, but was also able to draw heavily on the expertise of the foremost Italian antiquary, Antonio Nibi. In his two volumes, he drew together a considerable body of knowledge and offered an entirely different perspective on Rome than that which had been traditionally offered. His was a view of Rome which built up a picture of the layout and physical appearance of the ancient city, bit by bit, describing how the buildings related to each other, what remained of them now, and how they could be traced through the fabric of the modern city. Um, that's uh, an example of one of his um, illustrations. <coughs> Well, that's a nice coloured picture for you to look at, because I haven't got um, many more slides for quite a long time. <laughs> a bit more attractive than black and white. Anyway, this is not to say that no one had an anticipated him before, but his account of Rome offered a new approach for English representations of the city at least. Italian antiquaries had always shown much more interest in the historical layers of Rome and in the intersection of the different periods of Rome's history. If you look at the descriptions of the Corone Venuti Piranesi, for example, they showed a keen sense of how ancient remains were reused and reincorporated into later buildings, and how the modern city was superimposed upon the old. They also displayed more interest in attempts to reconstruct the appearance of the ancient city. The English were, in the main, unimpressed by what they regarded as the tedious pedantry of the Corone or the overactive imagination of Piranesi. But whereas Italian antiquaries such as Ficaroni might alert their readers to the buried remains of Roman workshops or other less grandiose structures, English visitors, as we've noted, wanted only to view buildings which had an event or a person associated with them. They were positively impatient with ruins which were otherwise unidentifiable. But by the end of the 18th century, again, writers are beginning to show more interest in a Rome which was not purely monumental. This is a trait which becomes increasingly marked in subsequent decades. So Andrew Lumsden, writing in 1797, for example, began his account of the antiquities of Rome by describing how irregularly Rome had been originally built, with narrow streets and tall houses, so tall that they often fell down, hence necessitating legislation to restrict the height of houses and stipulating a minimum gap between them. This, he explained, was the origin of the insulae, the high-rise tenements, which had housed most of the population of Rome. The practicalities of domestic housing had never before been discussed by English visitors to Rome, whose vision of the city was one which was entirely depopulated and monumental. He also enlightened his readers, by now used to a century or more of building regulations in British cities, to the laws of Constantine and Theodosius, which had stipulated a minimum distance to be maintained between private houses and public buildings. But half a century earlier, Venuti had been offering his thoughts on domestic housing of the ancient Romans, drawing on both literary evidence and newly discovered remains at Herculaneum and Pompeii, which brought to life the everyday reality of Roman life in a way that imperial, the imperial grandeur of Rome never could do. But it took English visitors much longer than the Italian antiquaries to apply this kind of insight to a city like Rome. This non-monumental vision was taken further in Burgess in his Topography's Antiquities of 1831. He devoted each chapter to a different quarter of the city and introduced each one with an enumeration of the insulae and the population in the 4th century based on contemporary estimates. estimates. 
Edward Burton in a description of the antiquities and other curiosities of Rome, which was published 10 years early. Similarly, similarly used very traditional sources, such as Tacitus and Suetonius, but raided them for comments which conveyed a sense of a closely packed, densely built environment of Rome, and showed that for all its magnificence, like any other city, it had its areas of human squalor and misery. Even the temples, he suggested, were not necessarily as magnificent as subsequent generations had liked to make out. And he reiterated, too, his sense of the unbroken continuity of history represented by the physical fabric of Rome, demonstrating how the history of a city in its successive stages, as opposed to at a particular epochal moment, could be read back through its buildings. Rome, he explained, though frequently overthrown, has never been deserted. It stands as a link in the chain which connects ancient and modern history. And in this part, the continuity has never been broken. Even if contemporary accounts were silent, we might learn from recent excavations how overwhelming were the calamities which befell this unhappy city. The heightened awareness of the evolution of architectural style and the interest in the historical evidence of archaeological excavations was also extended to the city's decline and the medieval period which succeeded it. One of the critical differences between the Rome which visitors in the post-Napoleonic era visited and that of the Grand Tour era was the acknowledgement of a non-classical city and its non-classical past. And it's this change and how it came about that I want briefly to consider now. Joseph Addison had given a cursory dismissal of Christian antiquities in Rome as unworthy of study and devoid of interest compared to those of antiquity. Though of a fresher date, he remarked, they are so embroiled with fable and legend that one receives but little satisfaction from searching into them. It was an attitude which continued to shape responses to early Christian Rome for much of the 18th century. In 1730, Edward Wright observed that the churches built at the time of Constantine were worthy of little note for their architecture. Their only point of interest to a visitor were the very fine pillars taken from ancient heathen buildings. Fifty years later, James Edward Smith described the churches in the vicinity of the Ponte Rotto, which were interesting, he noted, for what they had been, but that is, classical temples, rather than what they were now. One could point to any number of similar comments from travel literature and visitors' comments throughout the century. And it's easy, of course, to account for this lack of interest. Hostility and suspicion towards Catholicism was a defining feature of British Protestantism during the 18th century. And the prevailing attitude towards that period of European history in general was that it was unedifying. Moreover, the Catholic Church, it was believed, had been responsible for destroying much of the classical heritage that remained. In some cases, as Wright noted, fortuitously preserving elements of antiquity in so doing, but in others, destroying the monuments of antiquity out of sheer narrow-minded intolerance, ignorance, or greed and laziness in pursuit of building materials. The activities of the papacy in reusing materials from the Colosseum or the Pantheon to construct the Baldacchino and St. Peter's or their own palaces were simply the more recent examples of failed custodianship. The Catholics were, and always had been, it was said, poor custodians of the heritage which they inhabited. They were incurious, said Francis Drake, about the remains of their ancestors. They kept the fabrics repaired in motley magnificence, and were it not for the learned curiosities of strangers, such as himself, the elegant remains of antiquity would be allowed to fall into even greater disrepair. Even those of a more antiquarian cast of mind who might have been supposed to have a greater interest in the early history of Christianity. For example, high churchmen whose own antiquarian researches in England were heavily taken up with establishing the contours of the first introduction of Christianity to the British Isles. These had little interest in its manifestations in Rome. So, for example, neither the Jacobite antiquary Richard Rawlinson, nor Francis Drake, son of another Jacobite antiquary, Francis Drake of York, recognised the early Christian or medieval era in their accounts of Rome. Rawlinson's notes on his stay are particularly interesting because he did visit far more churches than was the custom and wasn't simply impelled by this pursuit of virtue, but his interest was in the rites and the liturgy rather than the physical fabric in which the liturgy took place. So he trotted off to the various churches on their respective patronal festivals to listen to the music, to observe the ceremonies and the exposition of relics, 
taking notes on the sermon, but any interest in the fabric itself as a product of or evidence for the history of early or medieval Christianity was missing. But as I mentioned, this changes. So when, why and how? I think partly we need to look at what goes on in antiquarianism in Britain, and I would say that having published a book on it earlier. Um, Richard Rawlinson, again, offers us a good starting point. As well as spending several years in Rome, he's one of the leading English antiquaries of the time and published, amongst many other things, a series of descriptions of cathedral antiquities. And as a high churchman, he was convinced of the importance of maintaining and preserving the continuity of true religion, keeping alive the memory of benefactors and patrons. So his account of cathedral antiquities was primarily concerned with endowments, benefactions, incumbents, prop uh, um, the property of a church, as opposed to the physical fabric, which um, for most 18th century observers at this point were simply Gothic aberrations from a classical ideal. But there were others in his circle, such as a character called Brian Willis, who shared similar high church sympathies, but took a much more positive view of the architectural form. So Willis and others like him were developing a much more informed interest in the development of Gothic architecture. It particularly apparent from the 1740s. They traced it from its Saxon origins, which they recognised as a debased form of Roman architecture, through to the full flowering of a pointed style and its transition to the perpendicular and then the revival with Inigo Jones of a classically derived style again. We commonly associate this kind of articulation of the different periods of Gothic architecture with Rickman's attempt to discriminate the styles of English architecture, which was published in 1817. But amongst antiquaries, if not the public at large, this basic chronology was being adumbrated in manuscript accounts as early as the 1740s. And by the end of a century, this approach and knowledge of Gothic, Gothic architecture is becoming much more widespread. Publications like Thomas Wharton's Observations on Spencer's Fairy Queen, 1754, James Bentham's Account of Eden Cathedral, 1771, became the basis for much more popular publications like Francis Grace's Antiquities of England and Wales and articles in the Gentleman's Magazine, and one can see these filtering through quite easily. And that this ensures that the reading public, which is uh, precisely the kind of public which is going to be travelling to Italy, and the people who buy these kinds of volumes are precisely the people who go on the grand tour. Um, so they're beginning to acquire the vocabulary with which to describe the different elements and styles of medieval architecture, and being taught how to like, read the building. When the only adjective available to describe the building is Gothic, there's a limit to what one can say. But once the distinctions have been drawn between Saxon and the different stages of pointed architecture, travellers' eyes can be educated to look upon medieval buildings with much greater discrimination and much more appreciation. So it's no longer seen as simply a barbaric aberration. And this greater familiarity does begin to filter into observations of travellers by the later 18th century. So, for example, we find them comparing buildings such as the Duomo at Siena with monuments with which they're more familiar in the English context. So the tabernacle work of Aqua was very elegant at Siena, was very elegant according to Adam Walker in 1791, but not equal to that of York Minster. The contrast is particularly apparent, not so much in Rome, but in other cities with more notable examples of medieval or Gothic architecture, in Pisa, for example, and I'm sorry, this is a 19th century engraving, but I think that makes my point that the interest is in the 19th century, the Campo Santo began to attract much more discerning notice from the 1780s onwards, both because of the frescoes in the cloisters, which appear to offer illustration of the rise of painting, but also because of the architecture of the cloisters themselves and the surrounding complex of the Duomo of the Baptistry and the Leaning Tower, where English visitors were particularly intrigued to observe the combination of rounded and pointed arches, which seemed to them to embody a confluence of two styles and to have an important bearing upon the question of when and where the pointed arch was first employed, which was a matter of considerable debate at the time. So this is already a bit of a digression. I don't want to digress um, much further on discussing the reasons for increased interest in Gothic architecture. But one of the factors which is of particular relevance here was the changing response to Rome um, and the increasing interest 
in the Middle Ages as a formative period of history and the emergence of European culture, which again is becoming apparent at this time. Whilst ancient Greece and Rome were still upheld as the peak of civilization, the process by which the European nations had descended into barbarism only to emerge again was being subjected to much closer scrutiny, and the interest in medieval architecture was just one manifestation of this. And this was, of course, the narrative underpinning Gibbon's decline and fall. Prior to Gibbon, there was conventionally little interest in Rome's history after 476, until Petrarch, who made the first attempts to revive the ideal of Roman liberty. And even then, he is simply regarded as a prophetic voice in the medieval wilderness. Most visitors' interests only revived again in the late 15th century, when Raphael and Michelangelo begin to restore the reputation of Rome for civilization. Gibbon's readers were now provided of a narrative of Roman history which carried them through a period which had previously been something of a conceptual black hole. Gibbon, of course, was no apologist for either medieval culture or the Catholic Church, and he was particularly unimpressed by the latter's record as a custodian of antiquities. Yet his account of a conversion of Rome to Christianity and the subsequent history of the city through the Middle Ages did at least draw attention to the extent to which those areas of Rome which had survived owed their survival to the, Christ to the Catholic Church. And his narrative also drew the attention of English readers to authors whose works would otherwise have rarely been read by any outside and narrow antiquarian circle, such as Baronius, Muratore, Bianchini, and other Italian antiquaries, as well as classical late antique writers such as Procopius, who had never featured particularly prominently in the curriculum of public schools. And again, I don't want to talk about the reception of Gibbon too far, but from the 1790s, it's very evident the influence he's beginning to have in that more and more tourists are, provide, are including much more notes on the period of Rome after 476. And a good example is Hobhouse's historical illustrations, um, 18, first published in 1817, or Edward Burton, who I've already referred to, who are engaging very explicitly with Gibbon's arguments, whether through refutation, amplification, or sim simply wholesale plagiarism. And Gibbon's view of the culpability of the Christian church with regard to the destruction of ancient monuments and antiquities was particularly contentious. For more so, as precisely by this point, right by 1820, British visitors are becoming more interested in early Christianity under the influence of evangelicalism. And a good example of where we can see this is in attitudes to the catacombs. Throughout the 18th century, these were regarded very much with scepticism, um, going back to travellers such as Gilbert Burnett, who's um, staunchly Protestant and sceptical account of the catacombs were um, extremely influential. He ridiculed the idea that they had been secretly excavated by persecuted Christians and argued that they were the heathen burial grounds for slaves and meaner sort of people. And this sceptical tone prevails throughout the 18th century. And the unhealthily close atmosphere, the tunnels, the darkness, the obscurity, the ease with which one could get lost, is all operated on a metaphorical level as an illustration of the evils of Catholicism. And by the late 18th century, you get an added frisson of Gothic horror with heart-stopping stories of extinct candles. But in the early 19th century, this is there's a shift which we can find in travellers' accounts. So there's a clergyman, Robert Finch, who's travelling uh, somewhat surprisingly in 1814-15. to 15. And he visits the catacombs and was overwhelmed, not by the noxiousness of the air or the endless capacity of the Catholic Church to replenish its supplies of martyrs' relics from the catacombs, but by the monument to the Christian party that catacombs represented. How glorious will their second clothing be at the sound of the last trumpet, and how many will rise from these obscure and lowly vaults to put to shame the princes and great ones of the earth. Insensate must he indeed be, who can spatiate in these obscure recesses without feelings of veneration and love for these noble spirits, who, when invested with mortality, with such patterns of virtue, who endured all things for the love of their saviour, who hoped all things for the glory that shall never fade away. One's heart is early sanctified when one has descended into these gloomy vaults. It's quite a significant change of tenor there. Finch did not specify his sources, but on his travels he did meet with John Shepherd Eustace, 
who was the author of one of the most widely used guides to Italy of the early 19th century, the classical tour, which went through eight editions between 1813 and 41. Eustace was actually a Catholic himself, but he was careful not to let his sympathies obtrude too far and defend the sensibilities of his Protestant readers. But he was, and in fact he was, rather more muted than Finch in his response to the catacombs, but again he expresses quite a different reaction to the traditional scepticism of the 18th century. It is impossible, he said, to arrange over these vast repositories of the dead, these walks of horror and desolation, without sentiments of awe, veneration, and almost of terror. We seemed on entering to descend into the regions of departed, wrapped up in the impenetrable gloom of the grave. And this sense of reverence anticipated a sentiment 15 years later, which was to become much more mainstream, echoed by Burgess in 1831. Whatever we may think of the histories which traditional fanaticism in later ages may have produced, we are compelled to be serious when we enter these gloomy abodes and witness those traces of persecution and mortality and tread upon the ashes of those who suffered in such a course. And this response to the catacombs is paralleled in changing responses to the churches of the early Christian era and the stories of martyrdom associated with them. Churches such as San Clemente, San Quattro Colonati, this is from the um, Vasi volume, um, San Sabiena, San Prasida, the churches of Trastevere, these are all increasingly likely to attract attention. 18th century guidebooks such as Vasi had always had information on these churches, but for the most part, the British visitors generally ignored them or simply recorded them for the paintings which were held inside. They were not interested in the, uh, their associations with early Christianity or martyrdom. But by the early 19th century, the rise of evangelicalism is, and the resurgence of moral reform is beginning to displace the cynicism of Connie's Middleton, the worldly to tolerance of Hume and the scepticism of Gibbon. This is being replaced by a much more overt and expressive piety, placing far more didactic and spiritual value upon stories of party and martyrdom. And this change in religious sensibility and how this in turn dictated visitors' perceptions is very evident in Richard Burgess's account of 1831. We've already noted his reaction to the catacombs. As San Pudentius, he described the vaults under the church which had recently been excavated, which he believed to belong to the original church, which in turn had been built upon other ruins. These early traces of Christianity observed and the traditions of martyrdom with which they were associated were by no means unedifying for the Christian. Far from being the subject of ridicule, rather, they allowed one to reflect upon these earlier scenes of holy zeal and piety and combine the little evidence there is left with probabilities. Again, Robert Finch, who had the particularly emotional response to the catacombs, was likewise interested in pursuing the different churches. He was an avid reader of Vasi, and in particular, what he took from Vasi was the dates, foundations, construction, and restoration of the various churches. Like Rawlinson, 90 years before him, he was a dedicated church crawler, seeking out even the most remote. And in this, he showed an interest in their fabric and its development over time, which Rawlinson had generally ignored. It was an interest which went much, much further than simply reciting dates. He was one of those, whom I mentioned earlier, who were really beginning to take notice of Gothic architecture. Not that Rome had many specimens of the kind of pointed or Gothic architecture with which he was familiar from, Fra from Britain or France and Germany, but nevertheless, he noted that Gothic structure of San pa Oh, sorry, I didn't do that. <laughs> um, uh, Gothic structure of San Paolo, observing that it accorded ill with the Greek columns and San Clemente, where one entered a court through a portico supported by two rude Corinthian and two Ionic <coughs> pillars and a Gothic attic. Inside the church, he noted, was inside, he noted that the church was in the Greek form with an isolated high altar around which was arranged the choir with two marble pulpits and three rows of seat, seats. <coughs> John Chetwood Eustace went further. San Clemente was, he noted, one of the best models that now exist of the original form of Christian churches. And we have the ground plan from his um, volume here. And from such churches one could learn with certainty the form of Christian churches in early ages, 
and on that basis make conjectures relative to the forms established in the early church, and to judge how far the ancients may have thought proper to transfer the rules observed in civil assemblies to religious congregations. <coughs> because the form of San Clemente had been preserved largely unchanged, it could therefore provide an immediate insight into the nature of early Christian devotional practices. Eustace's classical guide was published with ground plans and cross-sections of the more notable churches, a trend which had become more common since around 1800, showing which elements were deemed original and which had been subsequently built on. The architectural structures of these churches, as Finch and Eustace showed, were now being recognised as matters of historical interest. Rome, as Edward Burton reminded his readers, offered a kind of history and chronological series of religious article and religious custom. Burton, in fact, was considerably more perceptive than Eustace in his observations on Rome's medieval churches. An unreconstructed classicist, Eustace had little aesthetic sympathy for Gothic architecture at all, clearly stating his preference for the open form of the basilica with its long perspective and an uncluttered interior, as opposed to Gothic churches which were divided by screens and insulated by partitions terminating in gloomy chapels. Burton was equally fulsome in his admiration of ancient Rome, but was also keenly aware of historical significance and the aesthetic attraction of Gothic architecture. And so he warned his readers not to be disappointed at the absence of spires, pointed arches, and other characteristic features of the Gothic in Rome. In the first place, he said, the total absence of the Gothic or pointed style of architecture in the Roman churches can hardly fail to be noticed by an English eye. I believe it may be asserted that not a single specimen of what is properly or improperly called Gothic architecture is to be found within the walls of Rome. He then went on to list what there was and launched into a lengthy explanation as to why there were so few specimens. But as he appreciated the continuous presence of Christianity in Rome from its first arrival until the present day, offered a chronological continuum of the development of ecclesiastical architecture. Structures such as Santa Costanza or San Stefano Rotondo, which formerly had been assumed to be of Roman construction, were now being correctly identified as Christian structures from the 4th and the 5th centuries. The comparative absence of specimens of what was increasingly being labelled as Lombard and pointed architecture was highlighted, and the cloisters at San Giovanni Laterano or the apsis of San Giovanni e Paolo acquired a new significance as being rare specimens of the Lombard style. Romanesque churches, which had formerly been rejected as of poor taste, were re-evaluated. Features such as the Campaniles, which had never attracted the notice of 18th century visitors, were now rediscovered as picturesque features and specimens of the manners and customs of the Middle Ages. Again, I don't want to go into a lengthy digression of how 19th century antiquaries were trying to establish a chronological framework of the comparative development of Gothic in different countries of Europe. The broader point is that the impulse to do so <coughs> meant that antiquaries and the writers of guides to Rome and the more committed visitor were beginning to look at Rome in different ways, that the buildings which had once been regarded simply as excrescences or encumbrances upon the classical fabric were beginning to acquire valency and meaning in their own right. And we may attribute these shifts to the interest in the Middle Ages already identified, but also to a greater confidence in Britain's imperial rule, as noted at the start of this paper, and the concomitant modification and tempering of admiration for ancient Rome. The modern British Empire exceeded the furthest extent of Rome and was, moreover, lit by the light of Christianity. It was therefore superior to the decadence, cruelty and corruption of imperial Rome. How little did those proud masters of a the world then dream, said Charlotte Walty, e Charlotte Walty Eaton in 1820, that thousands from that obscure and barbarous island, when it became the seat of knowledge, refinement, virtue and civilization, such as they never knew, should one day freely seek this spot, when their name, their power, their laws, their language and their gods had vanished from the earth. And with this greater confidence in British imperialism and the greater value attached to Gothic architecture, Rome could consequently be found wanting. Burton, as we've seen, was forced to admit this to his readers, that Rome was deficient in this respect. Others were more explicit, finding fault with the want of Gothic spirituality. With an imagination deeply impressed with the imposing effects of the Gothic cathedrals of our own country, 
I expected from the immensity of St. Peter's, that religious awe and deep solemn melancholy, but which they, sorry, I expected from the immensity of St. Peter's even more of that religious awe and deep solemn melancholy, which they never failed to inspire. But St. Peter's failed to impress Charlotte Eaton. She was sadly disappointed by the frivolity of the ornamentation and the artificial grandeur of the design. Just as tourists were beginning to express interest in churches as evidence of the rites of early Christianity or as the sites of Christian martyrdom, they were now also being judged in terms of their capacity to inspire Christian sensibility, a theme which would become increasingly marked over the next two decades, culminating in descriptions of Christian architecture by Lord Lindsay or John Ruskin in the mid-century. By the 1840s, there were numbers of publications which were devoted to the description of medieval architecture in Italy, which was overwhelmingly conceived of as Christian architecture. Robert Willis's remarks on the architecture of the Middle Ages, Henry Galley Knight Ecclesi Ecclesiastical Architecture of Italy, and Lord Lindsay's sketches of the history of Christian art. All these gradually trace the, all these carefully trace the gradual evolution of style in architecture from its gradual decline of the late empire through the basilicas of the post constantinian church, through to the Lombard style, introduced, influenced by the pagan traditions of the north, to the pointed style, which was brought over the Alps from Germany. This was a new vision of Rome, which was far removed from the classical view of the 18th century, and as such, the era of a grand tour could really be said to have come to an end.